Hello Year 7, we've got another history lesson today and we're starting a new topic. We're going to be looking at the relationship between the church and the state, as in who's in charge. So our first lesson um, is going to be looking at somebody that you've probably studied before um, in primary school and that is Henry VIII and we're going to look at an event called the Reformation. So what I want you to do is... Um, your title, if you want to do this either on Word to make it easy to submit on Google Classroom or you can do it on paper and send a picture, um, is I want you to get this title down for me of why did the Reformation happen? And some of our key words are on the left hand side there. Uh, Reformation, we need to find out what that all means. Um, Roman Catholic, Protestant and corruption. There are four key words. We'll go through those in our lesson, explain what they mean. Another one of our key questions is why is the Reformation significant in the long term? Why was it so important and why is it still affecting things hundreds of years after the event? And then in terms of the skills that we're developing, we're going to be looking at cause and consequence. Okay, so how this happened and significance, why we remember it, why it's so important in history. So first task, and you might want to pause it to help you with this. Like I said, everybody knows a little bit about Henry VIII from primary school. So try and note down um, on a, in a mind map, put Henry VIII in the middle, um, either do it on Word um, or do it on um, paper. Anything you remember about Henry VIII. You can look at the picture to help you if your mind's gone completely blank, but anything you remember about Henry don't know about you, but I've been working on my Henry VIII uh, physique uh, in uh, lockdown, getting uh, looking more and like him, more like him every day. All the food I've been eating, but get something around that. You might want to pause it to help you. This will be one of the tasks that you submit. Every time there's a task for you to submit, it will say at the top task one, two, or three. So make sure that mind map is done. Right, let's move on. So as a background, then there are two main types of Christianity. Okay, there are there are others, but the two main types are Roman Catholicism. Okay, and the reason I put this picture is because that is the Pope, Pope Francis, and he is in charge of Roman Catholicism. He's the Bishop of Rome. He lives in the Vatican in Italy, but he is the head of the Catholic Church. And there are loads of Catholic countries like Spain and France, um, and it is the biggest. Um, denomination, the biggest type of Christianity in the world. There are 1.3 billion Catholics across the world, okay? A huge amount of people who are Roman Catholic. And then the other main type um, is Protestantism, okay? And Protest Protestantism um, comes from the word protest. So it, it was before everybody used to be uh, Roman Catholic, um, but then this man here, we're going to look at in a moment, Martin Luther, he started to protest against what the church was doing and set up this new new type of Christianity called Protestantism. Um, and included in Protestantism is the Church of England. And we're going to look at how Henry VIII set up the Church of England. So England is still a Protestant country and there are one billion Protestants worldwide. So as we said, this is Martin Luther. What a fantastic hat he's wearing. Um, so and on Halloween in 1517, this man, Martin Luther, who was a German monk, he delivered a letter to the Catholic Church in a place called Wittenberg. And on his, on his letter, he said um, a, a list of things that he thought were wrong about how the Catholic Church was behaving. And he thought that the Catholic Church was corrupt. OK, corrupt. One of our key words is corruption. And um, he thought that they were not behaving in a way that they should be. For instance, they were charging people money um, to get into heaven. So saying you can behave in a, you can behave how you like, but as long as you pay the church some money, um, we will let you go straight to heaven. So that was a sign that he thought um, the Catholic Church was corrupt. So he launched a revolution across Europe. Lots of people suddenly went, hang on, I don't want to follow Catholicism. I want to do my own thing. Um, I want to follow Protestantism. Um, so like we said, the key part of that word is protest. Um, so that was the start of Protestantism. So how does this apply to Henry VIII? So surprisingly, when Henry VIII read about what Martin Luther had done and read some of his criticisms, he was really angry because Henry VIII started his life as a Catholic. And some people think he was probably a Catholic all the way through his life. So Henry VIII wrote down the defence of the seven sacraments, okay, and which was a, a letter where he said why he thought Martin Luther was wrong. And he was really insulting about Martin Luther. He called him an infectious soul. Um, so really insulting um, towards Martin Luther. The Pope at the time, Pope Leo, his name was, Pope Leo X, he called Henry VIII the defender of the faith. So he thought that Henry VIII was brilliant because he was standing up for Catholicism. But this is where things get complicated. And you probably know about Henry VIII. One of the things I imagine you wrote down was that he liked a wife. 
or six. So um, Henry VIII wasn't a Protestant and he hated Martin Luther. He called him an infectious soul, but he fell in love with Anne Boleyn, who was probably a Protestant. Okay, this is Anne Boleyn here. He fell in love with her. Now, that wouldn't be a problem, but unfortunately, Henry was already married to this woman down here, the Spanish um, Catherine of Aragon, okay? And she was Catholic. Now, Henry was frustrated with his marriage to Catherine because she, wouldn't pro she couldn't produce a male heir. He could, she, she couldn't give birth to a boy. So Henry suddenly had this problem. And he, it was called his great matter, where he desperately wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry his new love, Anne Boleyn. Now, divorce, even today, is still not allowed in Catholicism. Okay, If you're divorced, and then that you might not be allowed to um, take communion at certain Roman Catholic churches. And communion is where they take the bread and wine. It's a really key part of the Catholic uh, mass or service. So divorce is not allowed. Henry VIII wrote to the Pope, Pope Leo, and asked him to annul, which means cancel, his marriage to Catherine. So he argued, okay, you're not allowed divorce, but could you annul it? Could you say, right, it never happened? And his argument, and you might think it's not a particularly convincing one, he said that because Catherine had been married before to his brother, Arthur, who died, um, that he should never have been allowed to marry Catherine. So because Catherine had been previously married to Henry's brother, which is a bit weird in itself, he says, well, I should never have been allowed to marry Catherine of Aragon. And Henry thought that because he had married his brother's wife, um, he thought that was that God was punishing him um, by not um, having a, a male heir, by not having a son who would take over when he died. Now, unsurprisingly, the Pope decided to turn down this request and didn't cancel his marriage to Catherine. At this point, we need to bring in somebody else. Okay, because as we said, Henry was all the, all the way through his life probably felt more Catholic than he did Protestant. Okay, so this is Thomas Cromwell. And you'll see from the picture, he looks like a lot like Martin Luther, which is actually quite helpful for us because they are both Protestants, both really important people in the history of Protestantism. So Cromwell was a really important advisor to Henry VIII. He was his chief minister and he was a Protestant and he strongly believed that the church were corrupt and needed to be stopped. So he got in the ear of Henry and he told him to he told him things to try and get him to react to try and get him to move England away from Catholicism. So for instance, he told Henry that Henry was so important as a king that he did not need to follow the rules of the church. And he also said that the church was richer and more powerful than Henry was, which was he was trying to make Henry jealous. And that was all because Cromwell wanted to push Henry away from Catholicism. So you probably know how this story ends up from, from, the, from uh, primary school or from things you've seen on horrible histories or stories you've heard before. Because Catholicism banned divorce, Henry created his own church, and that is the Church of England. Okay, The Church of England is a Protestant church. As a result of that, he divorced Catherine and he married Anne Boleyn. As you probably know, Henry's new wife, Anne Boleyn, could not produce a male heir either. She also couldn't give birth um, to a boy. And so as a result of that, Henry argued that she had cheated on him. There's no evidence that that ever happened. Um, and um, Henry had Anne Boleyn beheaded. So after all of that effort, he created a whole new church in order um, to marry her. Um, he um, then had her beheaded because she couldn't produce a boy. Now talk about this. Look at this for a rebound. He she's, her head has only just been cut off, Anne Boleyn. And within 24 hours, Henry is engaged to his third wife, Jane Seymour, okay, and she finally did deliver him a son, Edward, but really sadly, um, Jane Seymour died 12 days later um, from complications giving birth to Edward. So here is your second task, okay, and this is a paragraph, one of those P paragraphs that we've been practicing throughout the year. So we're going to look at long-term significance. Now, when we talk about significance, it is about, um, it's not just about what, whether something is important. We're looking at what kind of footprint it left on history. So um, we're seeing how it changed things in the long term. So not just at the time, how it still managed to change things years and years after this reformation, this break away from Catholicism happened. So one of the things you could say is that Britain becomes huge rivals with some of the Catholic countries, especially Spain. 
Okay, because we're now Protestant, and most of all the most of the other European countries are Catholic, we are now set apart, and we've got rivals. So you could research the Spanish Armada, which happens in 1588, where the Spanish come on boats to come and attack um, England because we have become Protestant. That's one thing you could look at. Other thing you could look at, the Church of England, as we said at the start, it's still the official religion of England. The Queen, our Queen Elizabeth II, is the head of the Church of England. And if you go to, if you go to the, your nearest church, there's a very strong chance that it will be a Church of England church. Um, and then finally, and this one is a bit tricky, but I think it's really interesting. So there's a historian called Lucy Worsley, um, and she argues that the Reformation is a reason why Britain sees itself as different from Europe. So they say from that point on, Britain always thought, no, we, we don't follow the same religion as you, we make different decisions from you, so we see ourselves as separate. And Lucy Worsley argues that the Reformation leads all the way to Brexit, Britain breaking away from the European Union, in 2016. Now, how about that for long term? Okay, this decision happened, the Reformation happens in the 16th century, and then even affecting today, um, this um, decision has long-term significance. So you've got sentence starters on there to help you, if that, if that works for you. So the Reformation was significant in the long term because, finish that sentence um, as your point, then give an example, tell us um, why you think it is significant. For example, you could say that it set England apart um, from other Catholic countries because we followed a different religion, and then explain how this has had long-term significance. This meant that um, we were now very different, so um, we were at war with countries like Spain, or um, we um, don't want to have to make the same decisions as Europe, which has led to Brexit. You decide how you want to finish um, those sentences and have a go at producing a good paragraph for us, either on Word or you can do it on paper and take a picture for, you, for yourself to submit. Last task. This is a fun one to finish with, I think. So you're hosting a dinner party and you've invited six guests. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not um, blaming you for choosing your guests, but you've made life hard for yourself. You can see the guest list below there. You've got Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon, Martin Luther, Anne Boleyn, Pope Leo, and Thomas Cromwell. What you need to do is you need to try and arrange a seating plan um, to try and avoid um, putting certain people next to each other. So for instance, don't put Pope Leo next to Thomas Cromwell because Cromwell hates Catholicism. You might not want to put Catherine of Aragon next to Anne Boleyn because that is the first and second wife, so they're probably not going to get on. So have a little play, try and work out. Again, do it on paper or do it on, on Word um, so that you can submit and let us know how you get on. The important bit though, as try and explain around your table plan why you've chosen to put certain people there. So for instance, you might choose to put Martin Luther and Thomas Cromwell together because not only do they love black hats and look and look very similar, they're also Protestant. So it might be easier for them to get along. Okay. So reminder then, here's your three tasks. You need to submit your mind map about Henry VIII. You need to submit one paragraph on why the Reformation is significant in the long term. And you need to submit a come dine with me table plan. And please explain your answers around the table. They all need to be handed in via Google Classroom for Sunday. Um, and any questions, um, please do. There's a chat f uh, function on Google Classroom or email your teacher. My email is at the bottom there. Fantastic, right? It, um, I've really enjoyed um, sort of starting to, to teach this way for year seven um, and hopefully this will um, be a way that we can move forward. I know it's not the it's not like a normal lesson but this is probably the best we're going to have to do for a while. So make sure you work hard, submit work on time that you can be proud of that shows what you're capable of just so we keep our brains ticking along while we're not at school. Good luck and I look forward to reading your work. Bye-bye.